This video is sponsored by Babbel, the award-winning app for learning languages. Click the link in the description to get 65 off a subscription. Animaniacs, I love to travel abroad, but obviously that's been a little difficult in the past two years. And if you also wanted to jump on an international excursion before anything else happens, Babbel is excellent and academically proven to upgrade your foreign language stats. The interactive lessons are breezy and engaging, and for just 10 minutes a day, it's guaranteed to get you to start speaking in three weeks. Even if you're not confident in your communication skills, you can learn a lot about a country and people through its language, and Babbel gives you additional fascinating cultural facts and insights. I picked Italian, if only so I can get some of the inside jokes inside of Luca. Dove abiti? Dove abiti? You can use the app on your computer, phone, or tablet, and it contains various methods and mediums to help you retain what you've learned, including podcasts, real-world conversations, conversing with a live teacher, and even games! Aw, it's a little 8-bit dungeon, that's so cute! So if you want to learn another language for travel, professional development, or just a mental exercise, click the link in the description to get 65% off a subscription. I don't think anyone has been super pumped for Lightyear. It feels like everyone has been kind of done with Pixar stretching out the Toy Story franchise in every way, except the way everyone would prefer. The Toy Story short one-offs varied, but people generally liked them, or at least they were easily ignorable. But then again, people don't pay $10 per short. However, I do have limited understanding that every studio is always pressured to return to a reliable franchise for guaranteed safe money to compensate before taking a risk with an original story. At least the concept of Lightyear is only loosely connected to their most beloved franchise, and theoretically, as long as it checked off a handful of bullet points, the iconic suit, a handful of the iconic lines, Pixar technically still could have made a completely original movie. And it has been kind of nice to see Pixar go to space, which they haven't done in a while, and possibly using it as testing ground to see how audiences do with a more, quote, solemnly toned film. And it turned out, okay, which is kind of what I expected. At the start of the film, Buzz makes an error, or rather does his best in a bad situation, that causes his ship and his crew to be stranded on an unknown planet. And from there forward, Buzz obsessively does everything he can to fix his mistake, which results in a handful of jumps in time. The first act seems to be consistently the most liked part of the film, largely because of Buzz's bond with his partner Felicia, and seeing the onset of how his mistake starts affecting his mindset and his decisions. I was also pleasantly surprised by Socks, who I expected to be annoying as the obvious toy placement of the film, but he ended up being one of the most endearing parts of the film. Then there's a bunch of cool action stuff with space bugs and robots blowing up and more space stuff. It's a perfectly decent space action film and certainly preferable to any of the reboots if older kids are in that more realistic look means it's more mature phase, but it's just not a terribly impressive 200 million Buzz Lightyear film. But as is the case when a movie is ultimately ultimately just okay, a critic's inner wannabe filmmaker starts speculating on all of the ways that it could have been better, even if it ventures into nitpicky, movie you want versus movie that exists territory. For one, you might think that I dislike the realism aesthetic, and I have been over the moon lately at all of the 3D-2D hybrids and the general more cartoony nature of a lot of theatricals lately, which does tend to be where my heart lives, but my whole thing is that I want studios to employ a variety of animation styles. Whereas so many tend to get pigeonholed into one mainstream variant. And I get Pixar trying out a more grounded, solemn, dramatic tone for the film. The problem is, you know what the muted colors and the gray spaceships kind of clash with? Buzz's original spacesuit. The original Buzz design and persona was basically if you gave William Shatner an Iron Man suit designed by the Jetsons. It was a very colorful 60s, 70s era space superhero pulp material. So from the get-go, it was kind of an odd decision to try and sell this movie as the one Andy saw that made him a Buzz fan. Apparently because enough parents and audience members were really preoccupied with the question of where does Lightyear fit in with the Toy Story universe? Does everything need to be continuity with you people? But it is absolutely the wrong mindset to go into this movie, because that's a direct connection to the toy version of Buzz, which only makes this version more off-putting. For one, that that movie would have been set in the 90s, and this, well, it's hard to get a handle on what decade this movie does feel like. There are some retro design aspects that does make this movie feel like it's partially influenced from Alien, and the idea that this in-universe would have been a live-action movie, 
Though if it was, boy, these would have been some world-class effects for the 90s. But the story and character focus feels more reminiscent of modern movies like Interstellar and Annihilation, though certainly with a decent amount of Star Trek. But more prevalently, this is the version of the character that would have been so popular he would have had entire toy aisles devoted to him. This guy who has almost perpetual mope face throughout the entire movie? I find that very doubtful. Heck, you can tell that this character and the toy are completely different entities just by looking at their default facial expressions. And clearly, if this movie truly was the inspiration for the character, the toy clearly would have come with a socks. Just call this what it is, but in-universe, a modern reboot of that beloved character that Andy probably would have seen as an adult taking his kids. Especially since they already pulled the actual fictional in-universe origin of Buzz Lightyear with the Buzz Lightyear of Star Command cartoon series, to the point where every episode opens with Buzz watching that show on a television. It's a still different but much more recognizable version of that character, not to mention visually cohesive. A show that just happens to not be on Plus right now, which is its own form of historical irony considering that the original show was made in the 90s but was told to delay until after Toy Story 2 because they were worried about it confusing audiences, which is likely what's happening right now. It's also interesting that in broad strokes, the premiere movie for that series is vaguely similar to this one. Buzz has an emotional fallout over losing a partner and he is compelled to take on three sidekicks that he doesn't want to deal with, with a surprise mass figure reveal. I'm not gonna go so far as to insinuate that that movie is vastly superior to this one, but in terms of Buzz's characterization and world being a much more viable origin for the toy, and the three sidekicks being memorable than the movie, yeah it is. Which I haven't even gotten to yet, because they're fairly unremarkable. Not unbearable, they're perfectly functional enough for this movie, but when people talk about the dip in investment between the first act and the second act, it's because of these guys. The third act picks up a little bit where they all have to be slightly more involved and we've just gotten used to them. Seeing Izzy having to confront her fear of floating through space is actually a pretty tense scene, and Disney has a good track record for sassy elderly characters, so Darby's fine, though she could have been pushed much further in that area, but Taika's Mo is the tone-breaking, distracting comic relief character I was afraid Socks would be. More so, Buzz's thing with his rookie prejudice doesn't sink in as satisfying a motive. In the cartoon, Buzz is trying to take on the Emperor of Evil by himself and rejecting at least two proven to be competent partners out of stubbornness and some understandable trauma. It's supposed to be part of Buzz's arc that he's being paranoid about making even mild mistakes, the way they weigh heavily on him and to the point where he is projecting those insecurities onto other people, which might have been a little bit more of a flaw if they were actually proven to be slightly more useful. That's not a bad motive for his character, but it's also kinda simple for this movie, and that's another aspect of why this movie is just okay. People have said similar things about recent Pixar movies feeling small and simple in story, but Luca and Turning Red are full of character, and character is kind of this movie's core problem. Buzz didn't need to be the toy, except for the hook of the advertising that said that this movie inspired the toy, but as a lead, he needed to be memorable and consistent. The first two minutes of the film is when he's at his most exaggerated. We see his dedication, his impatience, his dorkiness, his pride in being a space ranger to the point of being a gatekeeper, in exchange for just being serious but nice. That still worked in Act 1, where he was emotionally reeling and he had a decent amount of moments with Felicia, but from there forward, it feels like the three taglongs are drowning him out. We have that half second where his pride makes him hesitate to give the space ranger suits to the rookies, but maybe Maybe because of certain things that happen, the self-involved part of him should have been a smidge more present? But that's also a byproduct of what really needed to be fleshed out in this story, the planet and the colony. Slight spoilers, the colony is stranded there for maybe 60 to 100 years, and eventually decides to just settle there permanently. Now at the beginning of the film, it makes some sense that we don't see much of the colony outside of Felicia's apartment snapshots, because it's an expression of Buzz's POV. The only things that he's paying attention to are his partner and the mission, so that's all we see. 
but the sidekicks was the opportunity to get a glimpse of what this colony was like and how it's grown into a home for them. What it's been like living there, what unique aspects of culture or fun did they develop? How did they spend their off time? Did they just do science the entire time? What resources were they able to mine from the planet? How did that develop into unique technology or food that by now Buzz would know absolutely nothing about? The only glimpse we get into this is the gag about the meat sandwich, but that is literally it. I mean, why else would they have just decided to stay here? Which also brings up the question of, hey, there's a Star Command somewhere. Is that Star Command looking for this lost ship in any way? Yes, comparatively, it's a very small part of that movie, but emotionally, it should have hit much harder. The whole jumping through time bit is the major hook of this premise, and we barely feel like there's any significant difference between the time jumps except that Felicia is gone. And since another one of his big emotional motives is to go back to his old life, maybe we could have gotten a taste of what that was like? Even his I was a rookie screw up backstory is pretty basic. How about as a rookie I made a mistake and people got hurt? That would be much more impactful. And I find that what makes a movie feel big is the variety of locations, but because a lot of them look the same, you can barely tell in this movie. And there were things set up early that I expected to pay off, like the vines, or why they wanted to recall socks. I feel like this did have a much more interesting story that got watered down somewhere. Now, I still think it's a relatively breezy watch and an okay space adventure, but ultimately there's just not very much about this film that would stand out. And whether anything about it would stand out at all if it was starring anybody other than a very famous nostalgic character. I'm usually the person that goes if this was made by anyone else, people would think it was great. But even I thought a lot more could have been done with this. Raya took more impressive chances with this film. I thought at least hypothetically that they were using the Lightyear tie-in to deliberately do new, interesting, daring things, but outside of just trying to make what looks like a live-action movie, the representation is definitely a step forward, but I can already tell that this movie is going to become a very common YouTube critic punching bag in the future because it's an underwhelming Disney property, but more likely that this is just going to join the pile of movies that people forget about when they try to recite Pixar movies in order. But at least then, hopefully they won't try to milk the Toy Story franchises and features anymore, despite its obvious sequel hook. And at least I'm glad that this did bring people's attention to Buzz Lightyear of Star Command, which I expect will come to Disney Plus any day now. But if you want another recommendation, check out Dead End Paranormal Park on Netflix. It's a colorful, supernatural mystery that's funny and surprisingly bleak. And should I talk about Owl House and Amphibia? I feel like I should at some point. I'm going to take the galaxy's greatest hero and turn him into me. Huh.